This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Today, we spend the hour looking at the ongoing opioid epidemic and how it spread across the United States. Drug overdoses are now the leading cause of death for Americans under the age of 50. But during a speech on Tuesday, President Trump claimed the numbers are way down. He spoke in Nashville, Tennessee. We got six billion dollars for opioid and getting rid of that scourge that's taking over our country. And the numbers are way down. We're getting the word out. Bad. Bad stuff. You go to the hospital, you have a broken arm, you come out, you're a drug addict with this crap. It's way down. We're doing a good job with it. But we got $6 billion to help us with opioid. In fact, the latest statistics show there was an increase of opioid-related deaths and overdoses during Trump's first year in office. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, drug overdose deaths involving opioids rose to about 46,000 for the 12-month period that ended October 2017, up about 15 percent from October 2016. The epidemic has been so widespread that life expectancy is falling in the United States for the first time in 50 years. Meanwhile, the White House says it's about to launch a series of public service announcements next week on opioid dangers aimed at young people. The ads were developed with Kellyanne Conway, Trump's point person on opioids. This comes as The New York Times published a confidential Justice Department report this week that found manufacturers of the drug OxyContin had access to information showing it was addictive as early as 1996, the first year after the drug hit the market. Purdue Pharma executives were told OxyContin was being crushed and snorted for its powerful narcotic, but still promoted it as less addictive than other opioid painkillers. This report is especially damning because Purdue executives have testified before Congress that they were unaware of the drug's growing abuse until years after it was on the market. Well, for more, we're joined by Barry Meyer, the reporter who broke the story for The New York Times, which is headlined, Origins of an Epidemic Purdue Pharma Knew Its Opioids Were Widely Abused. Barry Meyer was a reporter at The New York Times for nearly 30 years, the first journalist to shed a national spotlight on the abuse of OxyContin. His book, Painkiller, An Empire of Deceit and the Origin of America's Opioid Epidemic, was published this week in an updated and expanded edition. He's won the Pulitzer Prize and two George Polk Awards for his past reporting on the intersection of business, medicine and public health. Barry Meyer, welcome to Democracy Thanks, Now! Pleasure. It's great to have you with us. We'll talk about this latest justice do document that you just got a hold of. Right. So, uh, the basic outlines are this. Uh, as you noted, Purdue Pharma has claimed that it first became aware of OxyContin's growing abuse in early 2000. That was about four years after its introduction. In fact, what this document showed is that the company had extensive information about OxyContin's abuse. Uh, in 1997, 1998, 1999. 20 years ago. Yes, and concealed that information. Uh, didn't tell the FDA, didn't tell doctors, didn't tell patients. And uh, this was a very damning report. I mean, the, the crimes were so significant that the prosecutors, who spent four years investigating the company, recommended that three top executives of Purdue Pharma be indicted on a, for a series of felony crimes, like conspiracy to, to defraud the United States, uh, false statements and things of that nature. Unfortunately, um, their efforts were blocked by top administration f officials within the Justice Department. So, explain what actually took place. What took place is the following. Purdue Pharma was given permission to market OxyContin as less prone to abuse and addiction than competing narcotics. I mean, this sort of was like, like drugs a, a like Vicodin and yes, others. Yes, exactly. It was a gift from the FDA. They took that gift and they ran with it. Uh, they told doctors not only that it might be less prone to abuse and addiction, but that it would be less prone to abuse and addiction. In 2007, they admitted basically lying to doctors, lying to patients by mis misrepresenting what they had been allowed to say. What we didn't know 
was that during the course of the investigation that led to that confession, the federal government had also uncovered information to show that not, not only had they mismarketed the drug, they were aware, almost from the beginning, that people were abusing OxyContin, significantly abusing OxyContin, and they concealed that information. Uh, had they sent a, a warning about that to the public, uh, OxyContin would have never become a billion-dollar drug, and thousands of people's of lives, uh, thousands of lives wouldn't have been affected by it. <clears throat> We're going to talk about the origins of OxyContin, the Sackler family. Um, uh, we're going to talk about how this drug company grew. But right now, um, your book came out, like, over 15 years ago, Painkiller. Right. That's before uh, uh, the company was indicted uh, and, the, and the corporate officials were indicted. Talk about Rudolph Giuliani, now once again in the headlines, because he is Trump's attorney his role in the rise of OxyContin and preventing a serious prosecution of this company? Well, uh, Rudolf Giuliani was hired in 2002. Uh, a lot of the reporting I did for The Times in 2001 was aimed at the overaggressive marketing of OxyContin by Purdue Pharma, as well as, you know, the growing reports, public reports, about the drug's abuse. Uh, they then came under scrutiny by the FDA, by the DEA, and they felt that they needed a public defender, a, a fixer, if you will. The person they brought in to do that was Rudolf Giuliani. And so he went in with his reputation as a former prosecutor, mayor, and so forth. And it was right at, I mean, you're talking about right after the 2001, it's September 11th attacks, when he was called America's mayor. Exactly. And, and sort of he took that reputation and he sold it to corporations. And one of the corporations he sold it to was Purdue Pharma. And so he became their sort of front man, if you will, their fixer, went to meet with uh, DEA officials, with other officials, and basically spouted the company's line. I mean, I have no idea what Rudy knew about what was in the company's files, whether he was privy to the information that prosecutors later discovered. But he became, essentially, uh, the person who tried to smooth things over with government officials. And was particularly powerful, because he was a cancer survivor Absolutely. himself and spoke about um, what it means to reduce pain. Exactly. And, you know, he made a very, you know, compelling argument. I mean, this drug has valuable uses. It, it's needed in certain situations. But, you know, what Purdue had done was to basically market this drug as a cure-all for all kinds of pain. And, you know, and with the vast availability of the drug, it poured out onto the streets. And that led to this, this wave of abuse and addiction. So who were the officials in Washington, the political appointees in the Justice Department, who intervened? And this also goes to the whole story of West Virginia and a really um, crusading prosecutor who took this case right. on. So basically, there were people at the very at, at the senior levels of the criminal division. Uh, Alice Fisher was then the head of the criminal division. This is under George W. Bush. Correct. And uh, Alberto Gonzalez was the head, was the, was the uh, attorney, attorney general. general at that time. So essentially what happened was in uh, September of 2006, this very small group of prosecutors, as you noted, in, in far western Virginia, um, Forward a re forwarded a report, a confidential report, to the Justice Department recommending that serious felony indictments be brought against the executives of Purdue. Uh, that report contained extensive exhibits, emails, records that they planned to present to a grand jury to support the call for their indictments. Uh, it was backed by the local U.S. attorney there, a man by the name of John Brownlee. And uh, it was backed, in fact, by mid-level officials within Justice Department headquarters. But on October 11, 2006, two weeks before these prosecutors were scheduled to go before a grand jury and seek these indictments, there was an 11th-hour meeting at the Justice Department. Purdue brought in its high-powered legal defense team, uh, met with top Justice Department officials like Alice Fisher. And after that meeting, there was a chill on the case. And basically, people like John Brownlee were told, 
we are not going to give you the resources to support this prosecution. You're on your own if you want to do it. And, and Brownlee had no resources. He had this small group of people who had spent four years, you know, 24 hours a day investigating this company. They were facing a company of unlimited financial and legal firepower. And they really had no choice but to settle the case at that point. I mean, the story of West Virginia is astounding. As you write in your New York Times piece, um, starting in 2007, the year of the settlement, distributors of prescription drugs sent enough pain pills to West Virginia over a five-year period to supply every man, woman and child with 433 of them. This is according to a report in the Charleston Gazette Mail. And we're going to talk about West Virginia as ground zero and exactly what happened to these communities uh, with Barry Meyer, author of Painkiller, An Empire of Deceit and the Origin of America's Opioid Epidemic. It's just out this week. Here on Democracy Now!, I'm Amy Goodman. Our guest for the hour is Barry Meyer. The Pulitzer Prize winning former New York Times journalist, whose book is out again. Well, it's expanded, it's updated, but this is particularly relevant. The book is called Painkiller An Empire of Deceit and the Origin of America's Opioid Epidemic. It came out in 2003. Um, 15 years, what a difference it makes in this country. How many deaths are we talking about? I mean, um, you have this incredible description of the death toll, writing, in 2016, 64,000 Americans died from drug overdoses. That number equals the population of cities such as Portland, Maine, Lynchburg, Virginia, and Santa Fe, New Mexico. It was as if, in one year, a plague had entered one of these towns and killed every single inhabitant. You know, we're in the midst of the greatest public health disaster of the 21st century. Uh, it started out with a drug like OxyContin. And it has morphed since then into kind of a hydra-headed beast. On the one hand, you have the misuse and abuse of prescription drugs. And on the other hand, you have this growing death toll from counterfeit versions of drugs like fentanyl. So we're in this very, very complicated situation. And, uh, you know, the kind of policies that the government uh, is now proposing uh, may not get us out of it. I mean, we're going to need a real extreme effort to get out of it. We're talking about, in 20 years, 250,000 people have died. That's just from prescription painkillers alone. That's from legal drugs. That's from drugs that companies are allowed to produce, sell legally, and that are prescribed by doctors. Uh, and that alone is, is a stunning, startling figure. So, I want to go to uh, an ad um, from Purdue Pharma. This is from oh, 1998, uh, the ad to market OxyContin. It features Dr. Alan Spanos of North Carolina. There's no question that our best, strongest pain medicines are the opioids, but these are the same drugs that have a reputation for causing addiction and other terrible things. Now, in fact, the rate of addiction amongst pain patients who are treated by doctors is much less than 1%. They don't wear out, they go on working, they do not have serious medical side effects. And so these drugs, which I repeat, are our best, strongest pain medications, should be used much more than they are for patients in pain. So that is an ad put out by Purdue Pharma, the maker of OxyContin, Barry Meyer. Well, you know, the there was, in the late 1990s, there was a movement to promote, you know, treat pain much more aggressively than it had been in the past. A lot of that movement was funded by Purdue Pharma, people like Dr. Alex Spanos. And, and there were these tropes, if you will, that, you know, the addiction rate is less than 1 percent. It was a total lie. There was no basis for that figure. But it was repeated, 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 and it sort of got ingrained into the medical culture. And as a result of that, doctors prescribed more and more of these drugs, you know, the, in, in good belief. The guy he was talking about? Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Spanos, in fact, that video, the, they made another video, I believe, with Dr. Spanos that involved a patient, and that patient wasn't even on OxyContin. He was on a totally another drug that came out. So, I mean, it was this, this massive public relations campaign that was funded in large part by Purdue Pharma 
to sell OxyContin. Talk about the growth of Purdue Pharma. Talk about the Sackler family. Um, what was unusual about this company? What also makes it so difficult to investigate? Well, the Sackler family is, is a fascinating family. As you know, their names are, you know, on every museum in the United States, here in New York, at the Metropolitan, and uh, at the National Gallery in Washington. Uh, their right. names are on wings. Their names are very prominent. <laughs> on elevators, on everything, you but name it. But when it comes to the drug, where they make their fortune, right. we don't see their name. Right. And not only that, uh, the, the, there were three brothers, Arthur, Raymond, and Mortimer. Arthur was the eldest. And he was sort of this kind of, I guess, you know, evil genius, if you will. He invented the modern-day drug advertising industry. All the ads that we see on TV today or in print are kind of the result of Arthur Sackler's genius, or lack thereof, as you see it. And um, he, he kind of wedded together the pharmaceutical industry and the medical profession. He made doctors shills for drug, co drug companies. He created uh, medical journals that were really kind of fake medical journals, because drug advertisers had to pay to get their studies into those medical journals. So he created all these deceptive marketing and advertising practices that are commonplace today. He died in, in 1986, before OxyContin was created. But to get his brothers into the drug industry, he bought this tiny little firm called Purdue Frederick that was located here in New York, uh, in Greenwich Village, as it turned out. They basically sold a lot of kind of crazy stuff. And then eventually, in the mid-1990s, they decided to get into the pain medication business. They first bought a drug called MS-Contin, which was a long-acting form of morphine. And they marketed it mainly to uh, cancer specialists, where the drug was very, very valuable in dealing with cancer pain. But then, in the mid-1990s, as this drive to uh, treat pain more aggressively began to unfold, they began to sell OxyContin, which is a long-acting form of the narcotic oxycodone. And uh, this became the most aggressive, high-powered marketing campaign for prescription narcotic in drug industry history. Uh, it was financed with Sackler money. The Sacklers were the principal beneficiaries of it. Uh, there were something like $31 billion worth of OxyContin sales uh, in subsequent years. And the Sacklers became, I believe, the 14th or 15th richest family in the United States. I want to go to 1998. Purdue Pharma distributes another video featuring seven patients who used OxyContin to deal with chronic pain. One of the patients was named Johnny Sullivan. I got my life back. Now, now I can enjoy every day that I live. I can really enjoy myself. And before, even a good day was hell. I mean, I couldn't enjoy nothing. But now I can enjoy myself. That's when I said wonderful. I look at the future the same way. Uh, uh, um, a young guy, 25, 30-year-old would. After appearing in that promotional video for Purdue Pharma, Johnny Sullivan became a severe addict to OxyContin and other opioids. In 2008, he died in a car crash when he fell asleep at the wheel. His wife said uh, because of his addiction, he would often nod off. Barry. You know, this drug, uh, for some patients, has been a godsend, but for many, many others, it has turned into a nightmare. Uh, we focus a lot about uh, on, on the subject of addiction, and rightly so. But not long ago, I interviewed a pain specialist who had been sort of on the bandwagon uh, promoting these drugs when they first came out. And he said to me, you know, addiction is not the real problem with these drugs. It's not the only problem with these drugs. These drugs, you know, caused patients to emotionally opt out of life, you know, to become couch potatoes, become withdrawn, uh, to reject their family members and lose social contact. They had all other, they have all other kinds of troubling uh, side effects. And so, you know, there is now a generation of patients who uh, effectively are emotionally dependent upon these drugs. Uh, a spokesperson for Purdue Pharma said in a statement in response to your article in The New York Times, 
His company is involved in efforts to address opioid abuse and, quote, suggesting that activities that last occurred more than 16 years ago are responsible for today's complex and multifaceted opioid crisis is deeply flawed. Your response? You know, um, I'm not a $600-an-hour lawyer. I don't come up with, you know, statements like that. But let me put it in simple terms. Purdue Pharma violated the trust of doctors and patients. It lied to them. The Justice Department discovered reams of information, which in their minds showed that this company also concealed extraordinarily powerful information pointing to the abuse of these drugs early, uh, early on when it was first marketed. What was the lie to the doctors? The lie was that OxyContin would be less prone to abuse and addiction than competing painkillers. They admitted that they had told that lie in 2007 and paid $600 million in fines. I mean, that was a drop in the bucket where OxyContin sales were concerned, but they admitted that they had lied. You write about how Purdue sales reps used a chart to convince doctors that OxyContin was more stable than a traditional narcotic, even though the FDA had told Purdue that the information they were giving out was bogus. Uh, that was just one of many lies <laughs> that they used. I mean, the entire predicate of the company's marketing campaign was based on a lie. I mean, that's the simplest way of putting it. The Food and Drug Administration had given them permission to say, this drug might be less prone to abuse and addiction. They trained their sales reps to say it was less prone to abuse and addiction. Sales reps would go, and, and sales reps didn't know what the reality was, but they would go to doctors and pharmacists and say, you know, you can't inject OxyContin. You can't extract the oxycodone from OxyContin and inject it because, like, the, the junkie will get a heart attack. They'll drop over and die. This is a safe drug. This is much safer. It was all an incredible lie. And at the same time, the company was concealing what was probably the most significant information they needed to tell doctors which was this drug was being widely abused. Who is Laura Nagel? Laura Nagel was the head, uh, a, a key figure within the DEA uh, at the time of this episode. She was in charge of the division of DEA that went after the diversion of legal drugs onto the street. It wasn't sort of the narcs, you know, the guys who busted people for selling heroin or, or cocaine. But it was the diversion division which dealt with the misuse of prescription drugs. And what did she do? She was a hero. She was a fighter. She saw what was going on. She realized that this company, A, was overly aggressively, you know, was promoting this drug, you know, to the nines, that people were dying from this drug. She tried to call them to account. And they essentially unleashed as much legal, legal and lobbying firepower on her to basically try to roll her over. And what happened? She basically backed off, just like everyone else in those days who, who came up against Purdue Pharma. 